From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is not with us today, but will be returning shortly. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Today's show takes us across the Atlantic Ocean to Belgium where, not too long ago, a serial killer terrorized the country. Eventually, hundreds of thousands of Belgian citizens marched in a public protest against what they saw as a high-ranking, ongoing conspiracy. A genuine and horrific cover-up. Matt, with any kind of episode or conversation like this, we always take pains to note This show will contain, at times, graphic descriptions of violence and abuse. As such, this may not be appropriate for all listeners, but we're not diving into today's show alone. We are joined by the one and only Mr. Matt Graves, the host and creator of the new Tenderfoot iHeart show, Le Monstre. Thanks for joining us today, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Thrilled to be here. We couldn't be more excited to have you on, Matt. Uh, Full disclosure, everybody, as with most of these Tenderfoot shows, I am executive producer on it, so I've got a bit of a bias in how I feel. You appear on the show? A couple times, but not as me. Uh, (laughs) Just as like random reporter number seven, I think, uh, (laughs) a couple times. Uh, But uh, honestly, this is... I, I wouldn't want to bring on any of these shows unless I felt strongly about the story. Honestly, and this one is supremely important for everyone to know, to listen to the show, just to understand the story of what's going on here. Ben, and I, I think you share that uh, that feeling. This story is of high importance. Agreed. Yeah, we um, on stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, we often we often go on air with things that have personally captivated us, and this story, which you will. You'll often hear referred to as the Detroit affair. Uh, this has been a story going on for decades. And tragically, there, uh, there are still many questions that remain unanswered in the modern day here in 2022 about this. So, uh, Matt, you're based in Belgium now. You're uh, from Texas originally. And you are the creator of Harry, as well as the creator and host of Le Monstre. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to investigate this harrowing case? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm from Austin, Texas, grew up there um, and then wound up just by chance actually coming to Europe. I was bumming around after university and there was a girl involved and all that kind of stuff. And and I thought I would stay in Belgium for just a little while, but ended up staying here for a very long time and have, a, you know, a house, a wife, a kids, a pets, the, the whole catastrophe. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely uh, uh, living in Europe now and have been since 1995. And 1995 was the year I moved to this country. And uh, I actually moved here, I think, within two weeks of the first disappearance that we cover in Le Monstre podcast. Um, and I remember it. I, I, I just remember it. It was a big deal, this affair. And I even remember it before the perpetrator was caught because these posters of, of, of these missing girls were, were everywhere and their parents were really fighting to try to find them. And uh, you, you, know, you couldn't be a person living in Belgium without knowing who these little missing girls were almost. Their parents were doing such a good job of getting the posters out and, you know, being on TV and talking about it and so forth. So it sort of literally corresponds with my the, my, my entire life in Belgium kicked off exactly when this affair started. And I've been here for the, you know, for 27 years afterwards. Uh, with one exception, I spent one year living in the great state of Oregon, uh, which was a wonderful experience. Uh, brought my whole family there for a year. 
that was a couple of years ago. But yeah, I've, I've lived here and lived through the affair as a Belgian would have. In one of the episodes, you describe a scene in, I believe, a grocery store where a mother was desperately looking for her daughter. Could you just describe that really quickly? Yeah, it was a scene that played out a lot uh, for quite a while here and to a certain extent, maybe even still. Um, because what was going on is, is you had a lot of girls disappearing. And, uh, you know, Belgium's a small place. It's a small country. It's like 10 million people at that time. And, um, you know, and then it starts coming out that there are, you know, these awful stories that are happening. Um, and it was sort of like a psychosis that hit the street and people were afraid. And I, I remember, I mean, I told that like in an opening, I think in one of the episodes about, it's a true story about being in a supermarket and just a woman looking for a kid, you know, and it's like, she's calling out for a kid and it's like, okay, yeah, lost in a supermarket. I mean, I've lost my kid in a supermarket a few times and, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, and, but she was hysterical. I mean, she was going nuts, you know, and, and then like people were like, ah, and everyone, everyone started looking for the girl and stuff. And I, I was like, okay, I guess I'll help find the girl too. And I was thinking, wow, it's a big deal to lose your kid here, you know, like, um, and then it was leaving the supermarket there. I saw the posters of, of you know, the first posters of Julie and Melissa, who are the first two victims in this affair. And then the second uh, posters were, were actually the, the last two victims, uh, Sabine and Letitia, and, and they were just sort of on the same poster board and sort of hit me like, oh, wow, yeah, that's right. There is a lot of stuff going on with like, you know, I was 20 something years old. I wasn't real focused on it, but it was it was sort of like it hit me like, oh, yeah, OK, this is, you know, things are going on here. It's kind of people are terrorized about their kids getting abducted. And before we get into the primary person involved in this story. Uh, uh, Matt, I, w I wonder if you wouldn't mind just describing how these disappearances were occurring. Like, how were people being abducted? What do we know about that? Yeah, well, at the time, we knew very little because they were just disappearing. Um, almost no clues. Uh, there were no clues. In, in, this, in the six disappearances we cover in this, uh, in this series, there were no clues at all for any of them. Um, it was literally girls just disappearing in broad daylight, um, which, you know, is quite uncommon. There's usually at least something. Uh, but in these cases, there was absolutely nothing except for the last girl who disappeared, which uh, thankfully uh, there was a little something that led them to make an arrest. You know, one of the things that stands out and that you emphasize in the show through interviews and through archival reporting is that the uh, there's a fact that people kept sticking on with these um, these appear disappearances that begin episode one, and it's that two victims disappear at the same time. And I believe what um, I believe that part of why this became such a, a subject of national attention was that same lack of evidence that you you describe, right? At least in the beginning, um, Matt, you set us up perfectly with the discussion of the the villain, the monster, for whom the Detroit affair is named. So, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about this character, uh, this individual, Mark Dutro, and how he, uh, how the Belgian public and law enforcement first began to associate him with this string of horrific crimes. Yeah. Um, as, as you mentioned, you know, two girls disappearing at once is very rare. And it's much more difficult to do than kidnapping one victim. Um, and he tended to uh, go in pairs. And um, so Dutroux was a, you know, Belgian guy who came up in a family, two teachers. His parents were both teachers. Uh, not a great family, like most times when you have uh, these awful sort of psychopaths uh, his mother was super protective. His dad was a bit rough with him. And 
He also spent some time in the Belgian Congo, very young in his life. So at that time, it was called the Belgian Congo. Now we know it as Congo. Um, and, uh, you know, African country that was once a colony uh, of Belgium. And so they were there. I guess they were doing a teaching stint for, for a little while and then came back to Belgium and ended up living in this place called Charleroi, which is really kind of like a, almost like a Pittsburgh type of place, you know, kind of gritty, um, industrial, and at that time, very poor uh, and lots of crime and sort of just seedy seediness and an underworld and and he kind of came up in that the grimy streets of Charleroi as I say um and he was uh yeah he, he was a bad kid early on and and got kicked out of school a couple of times and was always involved with just bad stuff like being a bad kid basically um and then his mother uh she ended up uh leaving his father and then sh his mother uh got a new boyfriend who was basically like a year older than Detroit or something like that. And that was a real shocker for him. Uh, he frequently comes back to that as being a key moment in his life. And I think he was 16 and he left home after that. And um, then he really, that, there's a real hole in terms of our understanding of his, the details of his life at, you know, from 16 till about 25. We do know though that he, he was, Basically, he studied and he became an electrician, technically on paper, but really what he was doing is becoming a petty thief, stealing cars, uh, doing all kinds of, you know, basic street crime and all of that. Um, and, you know, that's the sort of, there, there was also when, when he was 18, it's believed that he ended up living with a pedophile. Um, and that it was, it's believed that during that time, he himself became a male prostitute. Um, I don't think that was his main job, but he was just doing it. Um, so it kind of goes from bad to worse with this guy. Um, he's, you know, living in a bad neighborhood, becoming a thief, not getting along with this dysfunctional family, leaving, leaving home at 16 years old, uh, you know, getting into more crime, living with some deranged pedophile and becoming a male prostitute. Uh, and now he's only 18, right? So from there, um, he, like I see, you know, we don't know all that much, but afterwards in, in the eighties, he really starts getting into crimes against women, or I should say girls and young women. Uh, and that's his first wave of, of crimes uh, outside of his regular criminal activity because he was constantly a criminal. Basically, he was a, a full-time criminal, mostly involved in, in stealing cars and not just stealing, but trafficking them, right? There's a big, there's a big sort of almost mafia-led deal in Europe and Belgium was a big a place where a lot of that took place. So, you know, stealing cars and VIN numbers and then moving them on and doing all that sort of uh, car theft stuff. Uh, and then, but I guess he, he made his first forays into, into raping people. And uh, he, he, you know, the first ones that we know about, which there probably were others, uh, you know, were young girls. I, I think one of his first victims was 11 years old. Um, and he, he, he abducted her and raped her, um, threatened, you know, that if she told anyone, he would kill her, uh, took pictures. And that's another recurring theme with him and let her go. Um, and then from there, you know, there were four more girls that we know of at this time that, uh, were abducted, um, sequestered and, uh, abused. Uh, up to 24 hours, I think, was the longest he would hold them. Um, they're known, it's known that there were other perpetrators involved. And at this time as well, his wife got involved, or his second wife, I should say. And um, she was actually involved. I mean, she, she was literally driving the van when they would go abduct a girl. Um, and so, yeah, it's really dodgy and it's really dark. But then it gets darker after that. Let's pause here for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll dive back into the harrowing story of Le Monstre. And we're back. 
Matt, can you tell us about the timeline a little bit? Like, when when is Detroit kidnapping uh, girls, or at least assaulting girls, and then how does that lead up to the uh, the victims that are talked about in La Monstra? Yeah, so that 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 spate that I kind of went through. Uh, that started in 1985 when he was 29 years old. He met his second wife. He was had a drifter who was living uh, in a caravan in his uh, in his sh- shitty ap- house that he had down in Charleroi. And um, those three of them, his wife, this guy who was a guy named Jean Van Pettigam, who was not real not real smart guy, basically kind of a loser. Um, and, uh, he, Dutru and the, and his wife and this guy went out and, and, and kidnapped and, and raped these five girls, um, and eventually got caught. Uh, and John van Pettigam spilled the beans on Dutru and his wife, and they were both arrested and all three of them were arrested. And, uh, you know, he was held in, in jail and then went to trial and then was convicted, um, of, of raping and abusing these five girls and they also convicted him because he had he he had done a shakedown on an elderly woman as well and basically yeah was violent and 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 extorted money from her so he got sent to were were any of those victims killed none of them were none of them were they they were all uh left alive and i think you know that changed his calculus for his future wave of crimes uh but what happened then is he was you know he's convicted he was sentenced to 13 and a half years um and he only served a total of i believe six years i mean he he was convicted in 1989 and he was out by 1992 but he had time served before that so um in 92 detrue was let out of prison and the week or something before his mother wrote a letter to the warden begging them not to let her son out of prison saying we're worried about what he's going to do um so she was i think she wrote a couple of letters right um so he rolls out of prison and his wife at that time waited for him uh, michel martin and uh, yeah then you know they, he Belgium's a strange place. You, you know, you can you can get a pension or, or or social support here more easily than you could in other countries. And he managed to, you know, he was such a manipulator for everything. Actually, so he really always was always manipulating everything to his advantage. And he figured out a way with him and his wife to get this state pension, um, and then he got them to prescribe him powerful sort of tranquilizers, including Rhypnol. And it's sort of like, you know, suddenly here you got a guy, he raped five kids and, and not just raped them. I mean, it was bad. It was like he raped them and, you know, abused them and held them for 24 hours in warehouses and took pictures and, you know, awful stuff. And then he gets out with a really light, you know, spent six years in jail in prison and then he gets out and gets a pension, which is enough to live on because he gets it both for him and his wife. And then uh, they give him a bunch of rehypnol. <laughs> and it's like, OK, so now he's 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 collecting his rehypnol and he gets right back into the game. He starts uh, stealing again, getting involved in the criminal networks in Charleroi. And then he gets, you know, called out a few times for... Uh, he was molesting girls at like ice ice rinks. Um, you know, he got caught for that as well. You know, uh, uh, and he then at that time started going to Slovakia as well, uh, Slovakia and Eastern Europe. And I think he had thoughts that he could do good, you know, dodgy illegal things between Slovakia and and Belgium involving probably human trafficking. Um, and it's known, and he was, uh, you know, it's known that he did rape at least two victims in Slovakia. And he actually had two um, girls who visited him uh, in Belgium with his wife, you know, almost like as exchange student type of things. And uh, he raped them too. Um, and he, he drugged them and raped them. And in fact, one of the victims never knew she was raped until after he was arrested the second time, and they found a cassette of him raping her. 
So he was a he was a a, a, a real piece of shit, uh, this guy. And he then was was started started putting together his plans for his next big uh, crime spree, if or, or or sexual crime spree, if you will. This uh, is again, this is incredibly dark and disturbing stuff. But folks listening along at home, believe it or not, this is only the beginning of the larger story. And one thing that you point out there, uh, Matt, is not just his activities going abroad regarding the abuse of children, uh, but he was still doing the petty crime you described throughout this period as well, which uh, we mention in no way are we drawing an equivalency between the gravity of those, uh, those crimes. We mention this because it, is further evidence that someone at the very least dropped the ball in in the course of this investigation. And when when Matt Frederick and I were getting familiarized with this, of course, you know, we are not Belgian legal experts, right? We don't know <laughs> we don't know the Belgian justice system, but it does seem astonishing just from the outside looking in, that someone could commit any sort of crime at such regular intervals, right? Let alone sexual abuse, torture, and kidnapping, and, you know, later murder. Uh, It seems astonishing that someone could continually go through the system and then come back out. And one thing you point out in Le Monstre is that he, uh, Detroit Detroit is, the pension he and his wife are receiving at this point is higher than the average Belgian salary at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a guy who's on pension now, and then he sets about buying houses. He was a clever person. Uh, He likes to think he's a super intelligent person. Maybe he's, you know, decently intelligent, but he's very clever. He's very crafty and manipulative. He ended up on this state pension together with his petty crimes, buying five different properties. He bought these rundown shitty houses and uh, then he would become a slumlord and rent them out to people. Um, So he built up a whole sort of life despite having already, you know, think about it. You got, you got a guy who rapes five kids, gets thrown in jail for six years, comes out and start buying houses. And he didn't have any money from to start with. He didn't inherit any money, this guy. Um, and then you talk about dropping balls. Well, that's where this gets really, really crazy, right? So we only talked about the first crime spree. The second crime spree is what we're covering in Le Monstre. And there we have, starts with the disappearance of two girls, Um, and then, uh, there's more disappearances and then more, and then another one. Um, and the crazy thing about this, it's just so crazy is that these parents were so convinced that their kids were still alive. Now, most parents usually are, they, they don't want to give up, but these particular parents of the first two victims, Julie and Melissa were their names. They were eight year old girls who disappeared. They were only away from their mother for 15 minutes. They wandered off for 15 minutes and wound up being abducted. And, you know, it was like a, it was a small, you know, it was not that big of a deal. It wasn't a national story. You got two missing girls, right? So um, the thing is though, and and they, they, they did a campaign. They never gave up with their campaign. And for 14 months, 14 months, they, 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 they were still in the media, still fighting. And, and, Police and justice sort of abandoned this family. And all that time, all that time, police's number one suspect, after two weeks after the girls went missing, was Mark DeTrue. And then this whole thing becomes really, like, very... It, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, if balls can be dropped at that level, then this is the you know ultimate ball drop in the history of police work. But it's so blatantly awful that you think maybe there's a reason they didn't want to find him. I think we need to arm our listeners with a little bit of context around the police or the authorities at that time, Matt. Um, Just tell us really quickly 
What is the gendarmerie and how is that different from the local police force? Yeah. So in, in Belgium at the time, you had technically three police forces. You had the municipal police, you had the, um, the judicial police, and then you had the gendarmerie, which was like our FBI and the judicial police, which is like sort of a big national police, uh, but separate than the se- separate from the FBI. Uh, the gendarmerie is a military structure. So, um, you know, the, the heads of the gendarmerie were colonels and whatever generals or whatever. Um, and so you had, and you definitely had a, a backdrop of strong rivalry between jurisdictions. And so the gendarmerie were constantly trying to undermine the judicial police and vice versa. And so, you know, what kind of happened here is that the gendarmerie were the ones who kind of started picking up on Dutroux as a possible suspect here. And what they did is they went off in secret and decided to start trying to surveil him and, and to do their own little secret operation. Normally, they needed to ask for a warrant. And to, and, and to do that, you have to go to a judge. And that judge works with the judicial police, not the gendarmerie, right? So the gendarmerie... Uh, didn't want to give up the scoop, if you will. They wanted to be the guys who caught, or a lot of people think, they wanted to be the guys who caught these girls because they're these girls' faces were plastered all over the media. And, you know, suddenly they've caught on to Mark DeTrue as a possible suspect, but they never arrest him. They never arrest the guy. I'm talking 14 months later, their bodies were found, those two girls, two weeks after they disappeared. He was already a suspect. And then a month after that, he was their number one suspect. And, and they never issued a warrant. They never did a search. They never did anything. And it's just, it's just mind boggling. It's mind boggling. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, and the idea of jurisdictional uh, turf wars makes sense. That's, that's a very real thing. Uh, but also we have to, you know, we have to objectively ask ourselves some really difficult questions when we talk about um, what what you describe as the biggest ball drop in the in the history of policing. Um, I, I tend to agree, and it's it's quite understandable. Even if you consider yourself a dyed in the wool skeptic, it is quite understandable how so many members of the Belgian public would begin to suspect that there was something beyond incompetence that could explain some of the missing steps in these investigations. And and what, what you're saying now here about the jurisdictional police relationship with uh, with justices, it makes me wonder, without sounding too conspiratorial, hopefully, it makes me wonder whether the gendarmerie was concerned that they would get shut down by the judges if they asked for a warrant. Would you say that would, is that a, a possible motivation for them? Oh, it's very interesting that you're asking that question because... What they ended up doing was this, they did this stupid surveillance operation. So they think the true could be involved. And so they, they, they do this secret, literally secret operation, Othello, they called it. And they started surveilling his house, but only during daylight hours, which is odd. Um, and they were filming it and they were taking, you know, uh, license plate numbers of people driving in and out of the neighborhood and that kind of stuff. But It's sort of, the next logical step would be you have to do a warrant or make an arrest or something, but you can't do that legally without going to the judge. And as soon as you go to the judge, the judge is going to say, okay, let's get the judicial police on this, right? Or, you know, or or maybe, okay, gendarme, you need to work together with the judicial police and, and, and go in and do this together. But they didn't want to do that. They really wanted to keep it as their own, but keeping it as their own made it such that they had to keep it a secret. And so it gets so ridiculous at some point after the surveillance, and it's one of the saddest parts of the whole story, is that um, they don't ever go into that house until Dutroux gets arrested for something else. He gets arrested for something else. He gets arrested for some car theft thing, okay? This is in December. This is six months, seven months after the girls disappeared. And only then... 
did they go in the house? And, and guess what? They didn't do it with a warrant to search for girls. They used the warrant for this car theft thing. And they secretly went and looked for the girls. Apparently, they say they did. But it's just so weird. It's like, okay, you know, obviously there's a warrant out for this guy because he was involved in stealing cars. But they still, they, they can't get a warrant because he's possibly involved in kidnapping children. It's crazy. It's just crazy. And we'll pause here for a word from our sponsor before returning with more from Matt Graves. And we've returned. What we're what we're seeing is, from some perspectives, a a matter of tracing breadcrumbs, right? With the benefit of retrospect, uh, when you're looking at the ensuing investigation, um, we're talking about you know how maybe there was some uh, a, a bit of shooting oneself in the foot by having this secrecy, right? for whatever motivation um let's get to let's get to the moment where they do find evidence that whether an othello or uh related related incidents uh let's get to the moment where they do find evidence that detro or detru has uh has been committing these crimes or has been abducting and holding these victims. How, how do they find this out? So we're, we're in the, we're in the house. We're one, one of the properties. We have the, uh, we have the go ahead to look into uh, car theft or, you know, uh, auto related crimes, but we're, we're using that as a cover to figure out what's going on with this, wave of abductions and torture how how do they break the case well what happens is that the gendarmes don't break it on their own um and and that's always that that's why this is so mysterious because it when you look at it you could say okay this isn't that hard to understand these guys wanted to be the knights in shining armor right i mean these poor cute little girls julia and melissa had been missing it was highly televised and and people were you know, everyone felt concerned and they didn't want the judicial police to make the arrest. They wanted to go make the arrest. That would have been all logical. The The part that gets illogical is they never made the arrest. And so the only way the arrest was made was afterwards. They were they were forced to make an arrest because there was the, the last victim, Letitia Delez, went missing. She was a 14 year old girl and she was abducted in a place called Bertri which is in the south of Belgium in the Ardennes region, beautiful region. And um, there were a couple of witnesses who, who noticed a few things, one of which was this dirty white van. I mean, it sounds like it's stereotypical, right? I mean, they're, they were in a dirty white van, you know. Um, and, and then there was another witness who, who, who was actually a, a sister in the order, um, a sister at a Catholic church who uh also saw that van and the police sort of zeroed in on that and they had this in, in what, what you call a, a king's prosecutor the belgium is a monarchy and so uh, a high level prosecutor are, are called the crown prosecutor or king's prosecutor and this particular prosecutor had the jurisdiction over this area where this girl had disappeared and he's just happens to be this wily incredible individual who just jumped on it immediately, unlike a lot of the other paper pushing kind of people. He just was like, oh, well, this girl went missing. And he got in his car and drove to this, you know, drove to the town and started running a police operation, basically. Um, and and basically, you know, through him and his investigating judge that he, you know, in Belgium, you have to have an investigating judge when you're going to go do something serious and start asking for warrants and all that. You need a judge behind you. And so he got his judge, this guy named Conrad. So Bourlet is the, is the famous prosecutor and Conrad is the famous judge. And these guys just went whole hog and they found the true and they arrested him and uh, they got it through a license plate and they did a bunch of work. It wasn't easy. They had to, they really had to do a bunch of police work to get to find him, right? Because there was these two witnesses who witnessed them. And strangely, this second witness, this, this young man, he remembered the first three letters of this license plate and the make and model of that van. And he did because A, he was kind of an engineering 
kid who loved to like memorize things and B, and he's an engineer today, by the way. Um, and B, uh, is that he, uh, he was afraid that this crappy looking van parked in the street might try to steal his bike or something. So he's like made a mental note. I'll remember that license plate. And then, uh, it only came up really by chance. It was literally by chance because they were interviewing everyone canvassing the area and someone said, oh, well, you know, and then he was the boyfriend of someone who knew the sister. And it was almost random that they interviewed this guy and they thought he had seen someone. And he was like, no, no, didn't see anyone, didn't see anyone. And only at sort of in the middle of the interview when they said, is there anything else that you saw? He was like, oh, yeah, I did see this van. It was a little weird. I thought they were going to steal my bike. Ah, and oh, by the way, I know the license plate number. Bam. And then they did the search and then they got 77 hits and then they narrowed it down and then they pops up to True's name. And of course, you know, now you've got the John Darms can't control this anymore because you've got an investigating judge and a king's prosecutor on the case. Right. So this these guys are like, well, who the hell is this guy? And then they look into the files and they're like, oh, my God, yeah, this is guys. A, a, he's awful. He's raped, you know, five kids and went to jail for it and he, he's been you know there's multiple leads that he's building basements in his cellar let's go get this guy you know that's what happened and and so the gendarmerie didn't do it on their own they 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 almost didn't want to do it you think actually and somehow they got undermined by the by the investigating judge and the and the prosecutor Let, let's talk about the consequences that that occur because the gendarmerie kind of slows their role for some reason early on in the investigation they, I, let's talk about Anna and Effia and some of the other victims because it many more victims were picked up after they knew Dutroux was the guy or at least had deep suspicion yeah and that's that's the real sad part of this story is that you know he's their number one suspect but after that he went and kidnapped uh, two teenage girls on the Belgian seaside uh, 17 and 18 year olds uh, Anne Marshall and Effie Lambrex come from the uh, Flemish side of the country. So speaking a different language, uh, Flemish is like Dutch. And then the, in the south where Julia Melissa disappeared is the French speaking uh, region. And um, then uh, he kidnapped two more girls. Um, and, and these were both French speaking girls. Uh, but you think about it, like all four of those, you know, should never have really been kidnapped because he should have been investigated. And if he would have been investigated properly, they certainly would have found Julian Melissa, his first two victims, because this is where the story gets really dark. But he built a cellar. He built a dungeon in his basement where he kept these eight-year-old girls. And he kept them there locked up in a dark, damp, tiny room. And um, he would take them out every once in a while and abuse them and put them back in. Um, and it's, it's the saddest story you'll almost ever come across because, um, what happens to those two girls is when he's arrested, okay, for a car theft, they're still there. And now they're in an empty house and it's December in Belgium. And it's cold and it's damp and it's dark and the true's not there and no one's there except for the stupid ass gendarmes who are still, you know, trying to surveil him somehow and go look at his house. And, and, you know, we think that most likely those girls were sitting there when they went in and did that search that they were faking, you know, they were pretending to be searching for car stuff, but they were supposedly looking for little girls and, you know, underneath their noses were these two little girls in this basement, uh, starving to death. And, you know, it even gets worse in that while they're down there in the basement looking and this guy, Michaud, the gendarme who's in charge, knew he was looking for girls, knew he was looking for Julian and Melissa. And he's there with a locksmith and the locksmith is there to open doors and do things that you need to do when you're doing a, you know, a, a search. And the locksmith has no idea why he's there. He's just there with the police, right? It's not his business. So... Uh, but there's voices. They hear little, vo the locksmith is sure he heard little voices. And he heard this whispering voice sound. And he's like, wait, shh, shh stop. And, and, and basically, this, this gendarme says, shut up to everybody. 
uh, and then the voices stop, right? And afterwards, when you learn what happened to these girls and how they were manipulated and how Detroit told them a story, how there were bad people coming to get them and he was actually protecting them, you understand that if they heard that, they were like, oh, we better be quiet. The bad people are maybe here. And so they were really quiet. And then they didn't find them. Um, and so they left the house. And, and afterwards, you know, under oath at the court, at the proceedings, this, this locksmith, you know, he said, I don't know anyone if they would have known that they were looking for girls, which I did not at the time, I don't know anyone who would have left that house without tearing it to, to pieces. Um, and, you know, it's just another one of those things. It's just another one of those story. And believe me, we've only gotten to a little tip of the iceberg here. This story keeps going. The story goes and it goes and it, and it has almost every thing that you can imagine. Um, uh, I don't want to, I've got, there, there's, there, there's parts of it where it gets so crazy that it's not just crazy police stuff. The story just gets crazier on, on many levels. Um, and, and around episode nine, it's going to take a big turn that people are going to be like, what? That's the last thing in the world that they were going to be expecting. And it happened and it's all true. <laughs> it's just all true. That's why I did this. I, I, I started this being suspicious. I, I hate conspiracy theories. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. And I thought, oh, this was just incompetence. And, but it's an incredible story, you know, because it almost led to the demise of the entire country. Actually, it was the biggest protest in the history of this country. Um, but, but, you know, uh, when I came into it, I was very skeptical. But now I'm like, God, my God, something, something was going on there something was going on right it's unusual for a criminal investigation to lead to things like the uh, a judge being kicked off of a case ministers resigning hundreds of thousands of people marching in the streets uh and this maybe we talk a little bit about this because we don't look folks fellow conspiracy realists listening along at home, uh, there is excellent, excellent research in this show. And again, it is it is disturbing. But as you said, Matt, it is also undeniably true. The facts are there. Um, one thing I think we could we could talk about a little bit is maybe we can um, we're, we're mentioning some of the, the the missed opportunities in investigation, and I'm being very diplomatic calling them that. Uh, but let's let's also uh, go back to the first judge. You called him the famous judge, right? This uh, this one comes up when people are learning about the story, but he's not the only judge because he was dismissed from the case due to a conflict of interest. Could you tell us a little bit about what led to his dismissal? Yeah, and that's really when the shit hit the fan here in Belgium was uh, when, so this guy was, uh, these, this couple, of uh, this prosecutor and this judge, Boulet and Conrad, Everyone liked these guys. See, you could tell that they were just rolling up their sleeves and saying, damn it, these girls are going disappearing. We're not going to let this stand in our country. We're going to find whoever did this and we're going to not stop until we find everybody involved. Right. And and he was already almost sort of a hero of the people for, for just getting so involved and getting results early on as soon as it crossed his jurisdiction. Right. Um, and then, you know, suddenly uh they were both invited to like a dinner to say thank you you know for finding the Letitia Delez who who had disappeared and and was saved um and like a you know, potluck right like a, yeah, a, a, it was an like informal a, like just a thing potluck dinner it was thrown by like the the little village where she uh, was from it's a tiny little village and the parents and stuff were just like oh these two heroes who found my daughter and we want to invite them for a spaghetti dinner you know like probably worth about f three bucks, you know, total, total investment. Uh, and lawyers uh, for Detroit saw this picture of Conrad there. He was a judge. So technically he shouldn't be there uh, because he's supposed to be neutral. Although I don't think his neutrality was compromised by him being there. You know, anyway, the court of Assis ruled on it and said, nope, you're out. Um, we got to take him off the case. And man, at that point, that's when everyone was already pissed off about this thing. And then when that happened, everyone just, 
you know, like I say, the shit hit the fan here in Belgium. I mean, people, the, uh, you know, the hell's angels rolled into town, literally. And, you know, the, one of the images that, that I'll never forget is imagine a fire, fire brigades, like f- fire engines pulled up to the Supreme Court and hosing it down, just literally hosing it down to symbolize that the court and the law and, and is, is corrupt and we're turning our hoses against the Supreme Court to give it a washing down because it's all corrupt and dirty and we've had enough. And and like it was you're talking three percent over three percent of the entire population protested that day. That's that's the equivalent of like 10 million people in America. Right. It's unheard of level. You've got um, fire departments spraying down the Supreme Court. You've got uh all of the hell's angels of Belgium rolling into town. You've got just people, just everybody in the streets, just going nuts about like, no, we cannot have this. We, this has to stop. And, and luckily, luckily the parents who are, who are wonderful people, the parents of these victims, they're incredible people. That's part of the whole story is that they stopped everyone from tearing everything down. They were like, no, come with us and let's do a peaceful march insisting about how this all has to change and we need to clean up this system and get results in these cases. And it was a big moment of national solidarity. Everyone came together in support of these families. And these families were from two language. It's almost like, you know, a big congregation of of Republicans and Democrats coming together and hugging each other and saying, we all need to, you know, work better and be better and do things, you know, together and achieve greatness and fix everything. You know, that's because those, those those communities don't mix very well. You know, they, they have long historical grievances. And so they really came together at this point. And it was an amazing moment. It's incredible. It's a great picture, too. And that's actually what episode seven is largely based around, right? That just came out. It's called La Marche Blanche. Oh, how, how would you say it, Matt? I'm sorry. The, the White Marche, March. The, the French is La Marche Blanche uh, okay. or the White March. Yes. Um and it really does focus on that. And there's, oh man, there's so much information in there. I just really want want to ask you. Uh, you spoke with Corinne. Is that how you say her name? R- Russo, one of the the mother yeah. of Melissa Russo, who's one of the victims. Yes. And she has this quick quote that I just want you to react to when it comes to, I guess, the White March and how people were feeling at the time. Uh, She states, The gendarmes seemed like guys who wanted to find the girls, but at the same time, they seemed like they were afraid of everything. What what do you think that means, that this police force was afraid of everything? Well, I think, and and this is such a hard mystery uh, about why the gendarmes didn't act, right? Um, and I think, and she thinks that those guys that she was talking to on a daily basis, and even the guy who missed, you know, missed the girls when they were looking for them, and uh, that they were low-level guys in the gendarmerie. Uh, but there was something bigger going on there. There were some people upstairs who had decided that they didn't want to do what they should have done. And the big question mark is why, right? Uh, and I mean... I mean, some people just say it was all incompetence. A lot of people still say that. But when you look at it and study it as hard as I have, you can't have that much smoke without some fire. There was something wrong. Something was going on, right? Now, was was it that they were protecting this crazy pedophile? No. I mean, Dutroux was a loser. They didn't give a damn about him. Um, was it was it that they were protecting one of Dutroux's customers who might be a high-ranking gendarme or politician? Maybe. Uh, Was it something a lot more complicated? Probably. Uh, Probably to do with the police war, war between the police services and and the stolen car network and uh, various levels of of, of sort of corruption within the police. And there was some reason, some reason that they didn't want to go in there. And I think they might have seen, if you're skeptical or if you're a cynic, you say they saw the girls as basically collateral damage we have a big because they were in a war they were literally trying to take over the police force at this time and they were trying to 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 bury the judicial police and they wanted to take over the judicial police and put them underneath the gendarmerie and make the gendarmerie the law of the land and this was stated all the way from the top of the organization and this was a 10-year strategic plan 
like with and these don't forget it's a military operation and and they could have seen like this they've got something and they're doing something here and for some reason they didn't want to go get the truth and, and as i swear to you it's it's so hard to understand either they were protecting someone or it has something to do with a very complicated thing related to that stolen car ring that the judicial police were dirty on they were involved the judicial police were involved they were corrupt they were involved with the mafia and the and the car theft rings in charlois and so there's speculation that maybe they were trying to show up trying to catch the judicial police but that Detroit was in the way somehow and they or or if they if they if they caught him then they didn't get to win their long battle of of, of undermining the judicial police but you know, it's just it's just crazy and it's it's uh, whatever they were doing they didn't do their job that's for sure well let's you know let's follow up on this because one thing that stands out to me when you talk about when we're talking about the the Belgian public coming together in such an enormous show of solidarity is that they were coming together at least in some aspect to uh, to protest against what they saw as another much more sinister form of cooperation right the the allegations were that uh, Dutru was not alone. Right. The idea that he was not uh, simply. I I don't want to diminish this. The idea is that he was not simply a um, monstrous criminal with no other motivation than the commission of monstrous crimes, but that he had, as you, as you mentioned, Matt, that he had customers, that he had financial motivation, that he was connected with some sort of larger, um, larger operation on, on its own. And this is, I think one of the, one of the aspects of the story that remains mysterious to, a lot of observers, the the concept that this individual may have had accomplices. And sometimes when people are talking about that aspect, they point to things that we've discussed, like the fact that he was regularly getting off very easily for horrific crimes, or the fact that so many aspects of investigation seemed to be stonewalled or somehow stymied or even just completely ignored, like um, like DNA testing, for instance, which feels like day one stuff in this kind of investigation. You know all about the uh, the alleged and the proven accomplices, proven being his wife, for instance, uh, and and some of his other accomplices in car theft uh, and car trafficking crimes. But what do you think about the allegations that, uh, if, if we just look at this as a thought experiment, what do you think about the allegations that there was a larger network at play and that he was just sort of a, a field agent for that, for that initiative. Yeah, this is the biggest question that still divides people today. Um, for me personally, just looking at it, uh, it seems you just got to go back to the facts again. Let's go back to the facts. Like what was Detroit? Detroit didn't ever do anything for without money. Everything he did was to make money, every single thing. And he was notoriously cheap. I mean, he bought the cheap shit for everybody else and saved the good stuff for him. He stole gas. He had this weird way of stealing gas for his car. So he never had to pay for gas. He wouldn't pay for anything. He was really, really known as a skinflint, this guy. Um, and every single thing he ever did was for money. And by the way, he told people that he was going to kidnap girls and sell them. So the idea that he suddenly took on like, oh, I'm going to take six girls and manage that right? Uh, without any profit motive is hard for me to believe. Um, so I think if you just like back up and look at the general facts, you think, of course, he, he had to be, you know, looking to monetize this. I think he was a, a, a pervert himself and probably trying to have best of both worlds for himself. Say, yeah, I'm going to, you know, be going to rape and, and abuse these people and then I'm going to make money out of them. Um, so uh, if you ask me, do I think there are people walking around today in the world that were never uh, tried or convicted, I would say, yes, I do believe there are. Um, absolutely. And, and for me, that's, that's 
you know, it's just it's out of control to, to, to think about that. If it were a different crime, I'd say, OK, but we're talking about murdering, raping, abusing children. Yeah. There's a moment in La Monstra where you have someone, I think a, a little girl, read letters that were sent um, to the parents of one of the victims. By They were written by the victim. It's really harrowing to to hear that. I wonder when we're talking about monetary gain for this kind of thing, it seems as though rationally a strategy would be ransoming the children uh, if you're really trying to make money on, off of it. Um, I think the harder thing to think about is using the children at, uh, for sexual purposes. Like, I don't even know how to say it without throwing up. Um, it seems as though that's more likely as to what was happening if he was making money off of them. I just want to see if you heard, if you had any proof or if you found anything that would would lead uh, would lead you to believe that he was making money or profiting in some way off of the girls. Well, this is you know I, I did an interview about this today actually, and I won't do any spoiler alerts. I don't even know if we're going to use it, but it was uh, harrowing. Let's just say. Um, and one of the things that you realize when you start looking at these types of affairs is that there's a lot of this stuff, actually. There's really a lot of this stuff, not just in Belgium, everywhere. Um, and, and there's definitely child trafficking networks. That's a proven, you know, that's a proven for sure. There's lots of them. And, and, um, and it's lucrative business. And uh, so there's business behind it. And I think that as humans, I hate this kind of stuff. I, I never wanted to cover this. I, I, I thought I'm covering this story, right? This is a crazy story. The country almost had a revolution. The FBI was canceled. I mean, there's there's no more FBI, by the way. That was, you know, it's over. Uh, this affair killed the FBI. Imagine that, a case so big in America that the FBI gets closed down. Well, that's what happened here. Um, so... You know, I was thinking just about the, the whole story, right? And I don't like the details and I don't go into too many details about the abuse because the abuse was really bad because I do know those details and, and have read them and, and, and all that. But um, the point is, is that we just don't want to see that as humans. It's so unimaginable, especially those of us who are parents. It's just so terrible. Like my wife can't stand it. She can't stand this stuff. She's like, oh my God, you know, like... But I, I kind of turn back to her sometimes and I say, well, what do you want to just ignore it? Should we all just ignore it? Like, she's like, oh, don't talk about that. How could you talk about that? Why? You? And I'm like, well, OK, what's the alternative? We just ignore it. And I think as people, we tend to ignore it because it's so awful that we can't stand it. We can't bear it. But it's real. And this stuff happens. And there's people right now that are that are suffering from this. And there's big networks and, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist. You know, this is proven, you know. Um, and, and so one of the things that's opened my eyes in this project is because, again, I'm so skeptical. You know, I was like, there's not going to be a network or anything like that. But, you know, you start looking at it and you say, oh, there, of course, there's networks. There's networks everywhere. Um, you know, it's a business and, and it's a sickness uh, that's existed in humanity for a very long time and sweeping it under the carpet. I don't think is the solution. So we need to probably be able to face it. And because if you ignore it, you're never going to solve it. Very well said, Matt. And there are, you know, there are so many things that we're not getting to in our conversation today, uh, candidly, because they are addressed in Le Monstre and they are, you should experience them there. Uh, this this is an ongoing, an ongoing mystery. Like you said, Matt, there are multiple hard questions left in, in the wake of the official conclusion of the Belgian government, right? And I think it's fair to say that uh, even today in 2022, many people living in Belgium uh, do, not, uh, do not accept the entirety of the official conclusions. Uh, it may... It may shock some people to know that uh, the the person we're discussing today 
is in fact still alive. Uh, and I have actually gone and checked trying to keep up with the news about this. But uh, as, I, as I understand, DeTrue is still in prison, right? A sentence of life imprisonment? Yes, he's still around. Um, and uh, he's the, the problem with DeTrue is I thought about trying to see him, but he's such a liar. Um, you can never trust a word that comes out of his mouth. Um, and I've talked to his lawyers about that too. So, uh, and, and the parents, you know, he, he said that he was going to tell them the truth because they still don't know the truth. They still don't know what happened. That's the thing. They still don't know the actual truth. They know that their girls died. They know he was involved, but they don't know even the circumstances, you know, of, of how they exactly died. And, and uh, he, they want to know, but and to true at one point said, "I'll tell you now." But and he was trying to get something out of it, and you just can't trust this guy. He he's a manipulator. He's a psychopath. He's really a bad psychopath. Uh, so I thought, you know what? I don't even want to talk to this guy. Um, if I thought I could get something that would help the families, but all no matter what he says, they won't believe him probably. So it's just you know, it's not even worth the time. That's one thing I do want to highlight here, Matt, uh, that I think is another thing I think is very well done is that this show is not exploitation, which, let's be honest, can sometimes happen. When we're talking true crime. Uh, so I, I think it's an immensely respectful th and thorough, objective investigation of some of the problems with this case. So I, this isn't even a question on my end. I just want to say I think that was... Uh, that was very well done and and the correct way to approach this. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. It's haunted me uh, when I started this because I have to live in this country and, um, you know, I want to be able to, uh, you know, I want, Bel Belgians don't, you know, there was a couple of big attempts to do documentaries and stuff about this that were completely shut down by the families and the public just saying, get out of here, leave us alone. We don't want you to you know, make a big production out of our, you know, awful uh, misery um, or story. Um, but so as I started the project, I thought my, my goal, and I said this to the my sound guy the first day, I said, my goal is that the families would listen to this and feel that I did the story justice. And I think, I think I'm, I think I'm getting there. Um, and, and it was big in Belgium, by the way, when it came out. So they heard, someone heard that this story's coming out. And before, like the next day, uh, the, it's hard to believe there's a front page article about it in major national newspaper, uh, papers, actually. Uh, and then by the following Monday, I was already invited to uh, the primetime TV interview, like talk show, right at primetime, like Monday uh, you know, like, I don't know, the equivalent of NBC News or CNN or Fox or whatever, like the big, even not even like more like the BBC. It's like the BBC of Belgium. And so the B BBC of Belgium had me on their primetime show, like within days of learning about this project. And that that's how focused they are on this. And for me, I was really nervous about this because it's easy to talk to you guys, but talking to Belgians who lived through this and who know the case because they obsess about this case. This case is the most that there's n there's no case there where Belgians have obsessed over more than this one. Um, uh, but the good thing is, is that, you know, I think it came off really well. I, I was the, the, the press gave me a, a fair hearing and um, the families have, you know, that I've been in contact with have remained supportive. So uh, that's a big uh, load off of my back because I was a little worried they might you know, not like this. As somebody who's working on it with you, I'm really proud of the show because I, I do uh, 0.03% of the work on that show. And I really do appreciate just what you're doing. So keep it, keep it going. How can people find the show and, and learn more about it? Yeah. So you can get it. It's on the iHeartRadio app. Uh, it's on um, Apple, Spotify, everywhere. Um, and uh, it's called Le Monstre, L E. And then next word, Monstre, spelled French, M-O-N-S-T-R-E. And it's gotten off to a huge start, um, more than I ever dreamed of. And it's uh, a, a credit to the team at Tenderfoot and iHeart, to be honest, that we've been able to 
have such a really, really strong show because the support and attention to detail is, is floored me, to be honest. Um, and I love it. It's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm getting my rocks off for things that frustrate me elsewhere uh, by working, you know, with people that understand, you know, quality and don't accept anything uh, that's not, you know, fact checked, A, and B, done correctly and with support. So I, I really find it, it's, it's been fantastic to work with the team at, at, at Tenderfoot and iHeart Radio. So uh, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled and hope to do uh, another story at some point. You can also head over to monster-podcast.com to learn more. Fellow conspiracy realists, thank you as always for tuning in. I do very much hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, Again, we want to emphasize that there are ongoing questions in this case. Matt Graves is doing an excellent job researching and exploring these. Uh, We have also only scratched the surface of this affair. So if you would like to learn more about the monster of Belgium and the questions that remain unanswered, do check out the Monstra available, as we said, on any podcast platform you prefer. In the meantime, we would like to hear from you. Don't hesitate to reach out if there's another story that you feel uh, needs more public attention. And do not hesitate to reach out if you yourself may have some leads on the questions Matt Graves mentions in our conversation today. How do I reach out? You might be asking. Well, it's pretty easy. We want you to be able to find us online. Facebook, here's where it gets crazy. Instagram, Twitter, check out our YouTube uh, where you can see me trying to uh, convince my uh, merry band of miscreants to uh, to get a little weirder with things. So more to come on that front. In the meantime, if you don't sip the social meads but have a story to tell, why not give us a phone call? We are, say it with me, 1-833-STDWYTK. You'll hear a familiar voice and a beep like so. Beep. And then from there, you'll have three minutes. Those three minutes are yours. Go nuts with them. Get really weird with it. We listen to every phone call we get. Just all we ask is that you give yourself a cool moniker, nickname, and AKA. Tell us what's on your mind. Tell us uh, what, whether or not you are comfortable with us using your name and or voice on the air. And most importantly, do not edit yourself. If you have a story that needs more than three minutes, you don't have to uh, keep calling repeatedly and you know forgetting where you left off and then jumping back on. No, we've got your back. You can write it to us. Send us those links. Send us those photographs. Take us to the edge of the rabbit hole and we will do the rest. All you have to do is drop us a line at our good old fashioned email address. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.